you have to get it right to the end. And if you screw it up, you've, or if you mess it up, you have ruined the lives of 10 or 12 people. I saw her as a very dedicated nurse, but also a working woman. She had a family. She had several children. She also had several marriages. But she was someone I admire very much. I guess I'm a working mother, too. But there are so many women in America who work so hard. And being a nurse is also like being an actor. It's a, you have to be dedicated. It's a calling. And I think nurses are terrific, and I was so proud to represent a nurse and a working mother. I guess we did, yeah. We did a lot of research. Tom Fontana and I went to talk with people, and uh, we were very happy to represent that story. We didn't know we were the first, I think. You know, we were the first in a lot of things, but I think at the time we didn't even realize it. We were just doing it. We did get letters. And people said, I went through it, and it was very moving. Uh, my sister said, my sister lives in England, and she said, she was very moved by that story, and she said she forgot it was me, and she was so glad when I threw the pills down the john. <laughs> I forgot all about it. Um, it was quite a good storyline, and, and I think it happens to probably quite a few people. Uh, in a hospital because they're available. Yeah, well, I guess that's really what made it so popular, that we were about real human beings. It wasn't, it wasn't a glossy show. Nobody wore a lot of makeup and the lighting wasn't very special. It, it was real and it was gritty. And uh, we did those shots when everybody had to walk down corridors. And when you start it, you have to get it right to the end. And if you screw it up, you've, or if you mess it up, you have ruined the lives of 10 or 12 people. So it was very tense a lot of times for us to get it right. It was, it was a, a hard show to do, but it was so uh, rewarding. You know, I, re I read that, that people think people were dying constantly. That wasn't my impression. Uh, I thought we were saving people constantly. <laughs> but um, it was gritty. And you know what was interesting to me was that the show really was the hospital. St. Elsewhere was this noble, crumbling building and where people went as a last resort and we saved lives and we helped people. And whenever the show went into someone's home, when they sometimes went to my home to see the family and so on. I thought it was less effective because it was really the hospital that was the heart and soul of the series. That was what was so wonderful. They made mistakes and they were, I mean, Ed Begley's character was so funny but so honest and trying, just as a medical student would be, an internist would be. Uh, well, what were they called when they were after the residents? Yeah. And Howie Mandel, who was so hilariously funny when we were doing operations and he had all this stuff to learn. One day he said, give me lights, give me crits, give me, give me, give me, give me a hot dog. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. No, I think he's naturally talented. And uh, I had no idea it was his first. He seemed just like the rest of us. It wasn't always scripted to, to be uh, funny, but it, it, uh, we had some funny moments. I, I guess I was in the first show and the last show. Um, I was there the whole time, and I never could remember the blood pressure. Uh, I'd say, wait, wait what's, what's that? And they, the nurse who helped us said, it's 110 over 70. You've been doing this role now for three years. Why don't we write it above the machine? <laughs> I couldn't remember things like that, but they helped me. And I actually felt like a nurse. And I could never be a nurse. I, I have children and I can raise children, but when people fall down and cut themselves, that's different from what happens in a hospital where sometimes there's a lot of blood and 
I wouldn't be able to do it personally, but I could act it and feel just like a responsible, disciplined nurse. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? I guess you turn it off and turn it on, although it remains with you during the day. Hopefully you turn it off when you're driving home. <laughs> They love pointing out when we went wrong. My ex-doctor in New York said, I love the show, but you know, that episode where we would never, that kind of thing. <laughs> they, took, they took pride in noticing. But there wasn't that much to notice because we were pretty accurate. I don't think we did, uh, I don't know what other people felt. I didn't feel that we were making important statements. I just thought that the guys were writing wonderful stories. And they really were, you know, without good writers, you can't do it. And, and they were really responsible for everything. And I thought how clever of them to be so um, in touch with what was going on in the world and having the courage to, to write it. I thought that was great. But when you're doing something, you're never quite sure how it's going to be received. And we didn't know we were going to be a great success. Not for a long time. I never actually knew that it would last and that it would become part of the culture. Maybe other people did. I think Norman sensed it. But uh, I just was busy doing it and trying to get it right. Well, the feedback from my mother in England was, it's, it's, I don't like medical shows. I've never liked them. But that's, it's quite a good show. So, and I think it is hard sometimes to watch medical shows if they're, go into great detail and blood and guts and everything. And I think we really hit the right note between uh, very serious and very funny and very real. Because uh, life is pretty funny sometimes. <laughs> um, I suppose it would be uh, clever of me to say that I did think about the impact of the show on the broader culture of America, but I didn't. But I'm awfully pleased that it did have an effect. I, I was proud of being in such a well-written show and such a well-acted show. And, and I was proud that it was real and that it wasn't all glossy and made up and romanticized. I was very proud of being part of that. I did not know that it would become so popular and remain so popular. Um, but it's thrilling to know that if you really do it right, it can have a long life. Well, you do get very uh, protective of your character, and you think that you're her, and it, you know everything about her, and the writers sometimes don't. But actually, I never confronted the writers, because it's not a good idea to confront writers <laughs> if you want them to keep writing for you. And I thought they really did write very well for me. There was only one occasion when I thought, I'm not sure that Helen would do that. And I, I said to Ed uh, Flanders, I don't know that Helen Rosenthal would say that. And he said, nah, she's a woman who pays her own rent, which was the genius of Ed Flanders to give you your character in one sentence. I've never forgotten that because it was so helpful. But mostly, it's better not to get too protective, because they might give you something which opens up the character to another way of thinking. Well, you know, I said that St. Eligius, St. Elsewhere, the building, was the heart and soul of the show. But right along with it was Ed Flanders, because he played Dr. Westfall, I think, the head of the uh, hospital. and. <laughs> There was nobody like him. In one sentence, he could sum up the whole world, and, and his eyes were always so meaningful. He was a, an extraordinary actor. It was really wonderful to work with someone that talented. And, and uh, I think he really was the heart and soul of our show, along with the building. <laughs> My dear, you remind me of, he'd say if I did a really good scene, you know, you remind me of that great actress. He was very nice to work with. And he was, his whole life is just his work. And he's worked constantly. And he's still working. And he's met and worked with all the greats. And it was great fun to hear all the stories. We loved listening. I 
I just thought he was terrific. We went to see his stand-up. Uh, you know, he was a stand-up comedian, and he was hilariously funny. And uh, he just sort of made the natural next step onto the set. Uh, he seems to be at home wherever he is. And uh, he was just fine. Very spontaneous, very real, very in the moment, which is great. Yeah. His real character or the character on the show? Well, the character on the show, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, as you describe, he was a sort of typical brash young man. Wasn't he a surfer, a Californian? And he wore those funny uh, surfer shirts. Um, and dated all the uh, girls, yeah, as I remember. Oh, well, that's Ed. <laughs> he was pretty, uh, I'm sure in his youth he was pretty much like that. I don't think he's like that anymore. But he, uh, he also is a very interesting person because as funny and relaxed as he could be, he's very committed and spends his whole life about organic and green and electric cars. He was the first one to have an electric car. Uh, and he's very serious about that, but you'd never really know it because he doesn't seem like a serious person, but he is. I thought it was about a hospital when I was doing it, and the, the set was so real, and the nurse's station was so real to me, I really felt I was in a hospital. And I was a little surprised when I now go to hospitals. It feels like being back in St. Elsewhere. Uh, they pulled the set down on the first episode that I was in, which was the first episode of Roseanne, and we were on the same lot. And they said, oh, they're pulling down the St. Elsewhere set. And it was a sad day for me. I felt very sad. But it lives in our minds. Yeah, no, I really thought it was real. And I'll tell you how real I thought it was. There was an earthquake, and the lights went out. And you could hear all the equipment swaying. And there was a very nice grip a guy in a white t-shirt, and he said, are you all right? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm terrified. We have to get in a doorway. We have to get in a doorway. And he said, all right. And he stood me in a doorway. He said, we're in a doorway. And I was clinging on to him. And when the lights came back on, he said, I think we're engaged. But, but he said, look at the doorway. And of course, it was put together with two nails. <laughs> but, New set. York, New York actress comes to L.A. and <laughs> thinks that it was uh, real, you know, ridiculous. But, well, it, no. but it felt real. It was really right. And the whole thing, I, I felt like St. Elsewhere. I was very protective of the hospital and our, our reputation, not, not in the television world, but in the world that we created. <laughs> oh, very different. The St. Elsewhere was long days of filming. And uh, saying uh, Friends was a sitcom, so you rehearse, and then on Friday night you shoot it in front of a live audience, so it's like being in the theater. So when you say your line, if you don't get a laugh, you know it doesn't work. And it's very, uh, very much like doing a play. And, but the wonderful thing about sitcoms, and the wonderful thing about Friends particularly, was that the writers would give you a, a funnier line right then and there. If one line didn't work, they'd give you another one. And they were so good at coming up with lines. It was, it was very alive. It's fun, yeah. It was fun. It was a challenge. It was nice. Kept us on our toes. And it was nice working with Elliot Gould as my husband. I felt married to him. I felt like we were a real couple. Ah, oh, Elliot. <laughs> well, you know, I think it starts with the writing. If the writing is really good, it's very easy to step into that world because they've created the world for you to fill. And it becomes enormously interesting to become somebody else and to fulfill that particular world. That, I think, is why I like being an actor, because you become all these other people. But it's always a part of you. It's me if I lived on Long Island and was married to uh, Elliot's character, or me if I lived in Boston, being a nurse. Um, but the writers give you the character to fill out. They talk about the lunts and 
and putting things down on a specific word and making it all. I suppose if I was doing that kind of a play, I could get into that. But uh, I like being a bit looser. It was fun. It was the first uh, episode. It wasn't the pilot. It was, and it was great. I thought she was fantastic. She was so comfortable with herself and so knowing what she wanted and getting it. And that's hard to do in television sitcoms. But I thought she was great. I enjoyed it. She, she knew what she wanted and she did it. And I think that anyone who does that is not always popular everywhere. And I really respect the fact that she hung on to that. And that show was brilliant. Speaking of making a real world, one actress said to me, let me give you a tip. If you're on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, learn Fridays first, because by Friday you'll be so tired you won't be able to learn it. <laughs> it was a good tip. Uh, and uh, there's an actor called Jimmy Caron who was on a soap opera. And uh, one day he was on the subway in New York, and he was reading the New York Times, and he started learning it. And he said, oh my God, I've got to get off this soap because our lives became learning, <laughs> learning the lines. And anything you see, you start learning because it's such a necessity to know it. You know. There were teleprompters, but I never could use them. Some people did. But it was good. It was fun being on a soap because uh, I did plays at the same time. So I got both worlds. And soaps paid well. And theater has never paid that well. And so it was a big help, and uh, my character became very popular, and people noticed me on buses and things and knew who I was. And uh, I was sitting with Richard Dreyfus one day at the uh, Williamstown Theatre Festival, and someone came rushing over, and I thought, oh, it's a fan of Richard's. And they came to me, and he thought it was hilarious because they, <laughs> they didn't recognize him. They recognized me because they watched daytime soaps. <laughs> and a lot of housekeepers who, who watched were, were very kind and, and would say nice things to me. Well, I suppose a sitcom with an audience, you get the best of both worlds. So that's my favorite. Second is film, and third is theater. You know, there are many young actors now who don't do theater. They don't know and they don't care about theater. And it's very strange to me, who because I was raised in the theater, so everything starts in the theater for me. It's where I learned about character and performance. I don't know how they do it without that training, but they do. So maybe theater isn't that necessary nowadays, but it was in my youth. I didn't want to be one of those British actors who comes over here and only does Noel Coward. So I refused to do lots of things which required British. But then, 30 years later, I was asked to do Tonight at 8.30, which is by Noel Coward, and I was really good in it. <laughs> so, go figure. <laughs> well, one of the memory, memories I have was a very sweet scene in the nurse's station, or maybe one of the rooms off the station, where I was massaging Denzel Washington's shoulders because uh, he was having a hard time, and I was helping him through a hard time. He was a terrific actor to work with. He was very, very present as the character always. And I, I liked doing that scene. So that was one of my memories. Well, what is it about that scene that so memorable? That, that a nurse was being understanding and kind to a resident who was overworked. Residents very often think they know better than the nurses, but the nurses really do know a lot. And I think his character was never edgy about that. He, he always ex accepted help from nurses, his character. Well, I think it was a fun way. Um, I don't, I'm not sure they continue to do that I, 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 anymore. Maybe, maybe some shows do. Um, but it was fun. Anything that's a challenge for an actor who's on the set all day and, and day after day is exciting. So we like being challenged. But it was hard to learn, especially if it was medical dialogue. It was really hard. I, I spent a lot of time studying my lines 
because I, I was afraid to, to mess up, and also because it was always often unfamiliar sentences. You know, I'd never, I didn't speak that language, so it was, it was a lot of uh, work. But it was fun, cause it's because when you got it, you felt so good. <laughs> I think Norman, he did tell stories about Hollywood, wonderful stories, but, but I remember him saying things like, my dear, I was playing tennis with Charlie, meaning Chaplin. Or, and then one day we were having dinner and Hitch said to me, I, so it, it was always his social life that I remember more than the stories, which were extraordinary. And, and when he was, um, what was the Hitch film he did? where he was in the Empire State Building. He has a great story about that, but I never really could get it. I would listen to him, but I, when I was listening, I wasn't getting the story right. I was getting his, his idea of his imitating, imitating Hitch and, and the whole sort of feeling of that era. So there was something about the way they shot it that was quite unusual. I don't remember that, but I do remember him talking about Hitch and uh, the fun they had. And it seemed like that he played tennis all the time and had great fun with everyone he was with and somehow also found the time to work. <laughs> it was a pretty nice life, I think. He spent a lot of time with Walter Matthau and he walked with him every morning. And he would uh, say, oh, my dear, I was walking with Walter this morning and he reminded me of, he liked to bet, you know, and he liked to bet on everything. And he saw some birds up on a wire and he said, how much do you bet that that bird will fly off first? He bet everything, he said. He couldn't see something without betting on it. And uh, I indeed did see them walking one morning. And I was with my grandson, and I was holding him. And Walter didn't know who I was. But he said, hello, baby, to the baby. It was so sweet. He was such a sweet man. I think all of Norman's friends were nice. Well, you just pointed out to me that we all become Norman Lloyd when we're talking about him. Uh, and I don't think it's conscious. It's just that you can't tell a story about Norman Lloyd without becoming Norman with his cadence. My dear, how are you? And it, it's so sweet. And he's so real. He's not phony in any way. But you just become him because it's so distinct. Uh, he's he's a... Uh, and. He came to my house uh, quite a while ago when I had a baby swing, because I have grandchildren, and uh, he sat in the swing. <laughs> Hello, my dear, how are you? He said from the baby swing. <laughs> I have a film on that. <laughs> uh, well, I was on Friends one day. Um, we were doing a big crowd scene. I think maybe one of, maybe my daughter was getting married. It was one of those scenes. And Matthew was sitting at the table with, uh, with um, Elliot and me. And he turned to me, and out of the blue, he said, you know, you're a very lucky person. You've been on two hit, extraordinary American television shows. And I said, what? He said, St. Elsewhere and this one. And it was true. I, I'm happy he pointed that out to me, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs>